Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Welcome to the Fly With Us podcast. This podcast is bringing the art of conversation, self-love, self-care, mental health care and protection, life lessons, love lessons, and everything in between. Today, we're going to talk about white privilege. I'm Lady Bounce. I'm Kryptonite. All right. So you want to start with the mindfulness minute okay, first here, to here we go. go into it? Right. Oh, I didn't do the one thing. Okay, but anyway, this is called the right teaching. Through the uh, vistas of the past, the voice of the centuries is coming down to us. The voice of the stages of the Himalayas and the recluses of the forest. The voice that came to the Semitic races. The voice that spoke through Buddha and other spiritual giants. The voice that comes from those who live in the light that accompanied man in the beginning of the earth. The light that shines wherever man goes and lives with him forever is coming to us even now. This voice is like the little rivulets that came from the mountains. Now they disappear and now they appear again in stronger flow till finally they unite in one mighty majestic flow. The right teachings appear when you are ready for them. You don't need to look very hard. Only listen to your heart, to the inner guide. The wrong teachings when you seen them, well, excuse me, the wrong teachings when seen through the inner guide will appear cold and lifeless. The right teachings for you will appear warm and glowing. If you learn to listen to this guide, you will be spared many wrong turns and dead ends. Your path to illumination will be shorter as you learn to trust in your intuition. You will receive hidden guidance just because you were willing to ask, ask for it and wait for it. Get in touch with your inner guide this evening by living in a slow and silent manner. Do nothing extraneous. Work diligently, but with no haste or aggression. Above all, pay attention. If you can live in this way for long enough, you will begin to receive nudges about the right direction for your life. As you follow these nudges one at a time, a transformation will begin to take place in your life. Do not try to measure this change. Just take one step at a time. Hmm. So I chose the right teachings because our topic of discussion today is a documentary uh, that is on Netflix by uh, Chelsea Handler. Mm-hmm. And it's called Hello, White Privilege. I'm Chelsea. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought it was... I thought it was very daring of her. And uh, she's kind of a controversial comedian. Kind she of a, is. Controversial white chick, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Who dates black guys. Yes, yeah, she, she loves her dark meat. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and she had, a, you know, she had a few people on there. Um, she had Tiffany Haddish and she had Kevin Hart on there. And uh, she interviewed both of them. And K- Tiffany, Tiffany Haddish, her... Uh, her interview resonated with me a little more because she was almost brought to tears. You mm-hmm. could hear it in her voice that she was really, and I think because of her past, if anybody knows anything about her past, then we all know that she was in a lot of foster homes. She was right. in foster care and she didn't really have a, you know, a family that she could call her own growing up. And, mm-hmm. um, part of her answer to, uh, in the interview or part of her statement in the interview is that white people know where they come from. They have a history that they can go back to that they can trace. Whereas black people basically don't. We, we pretty much all we know is that we came here as as slaves and there's really no record of who we were or what we did before then because it was all erased. They wanted us to take on their names, their way of life, go by what they wanted, uh, their religion and what they wanted us to do, what they wanted us to know. So a lot of that had gotten uh, erased throughout the generations. And um, with Tiffany Haddish, her answer really did resonate with me because you could tell that she really, she really, really felt that it was really an emotional Mm -hmm. moment for her in that moment. Um, also, I thought it was pretty brave of Chelsea Handler because she, she went further than just doing a documentary and she, she, she really got into a point where in, at the uh, poetry reading where she was really kind of taken to task 
about what the point of her documentary was. Yes. You know, and they, and and a lot of the the brothers and sisters was like, "What is the point? Like, right. okay, you're going to do this documentary, and then what? Right? What like, happens after this? What are you going to take from this back into your your community, your space, your comfortable spaces with your people, with your tribe, if you will? And then what? And I think that's a question that it's hard to answer. But it also is a question that has to be answered. Because it's like, so what, now what? Okay, so what? You did this documentary. Now what? What are you going to do? These places where you frequent with these people that actually have the power to make the needed changes that would be beneficial to all. Are you going to rally those people to do something? Or are you just going to keep this knowledge that you gain or this this epiphany that you now have? And that's all it becomes is growth for you but what about everybody else or what not even everybody else but what about other people so you got it now what i think um for her even in that moment that was something that she had not thought about like you could tell that with that when that question was posed to her that um she kind of paused she, like she did she did she took pause with it and she did kind of think about it like I'm exercising my privilege just making this show about white privilege. Right. And it, and she, like, she really did seem to take, take it in. Like, yeah, what do I do with it now? Like, I'm going to do this and it's going to be done. But yeah, like, then what? You know, and it, it was kind of a question that she accepted and even kind of seemed to pose to herself in a moment of reflection when she was on the ride back in the car. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, at least she did it, right? <laughs> I mean, she did it. And then I wonder how many people that saw it, no matter what race, got something out of it to give them a starting point to make movements, to do something. Even if it's like nobody expects any one person to change everybody's mind or change the whole world but in your little pocket in your circle did it resonate with people enough that they're like wait a minute in my pocket of the world i can do this to make it better or i could do this to change it do you think people got that from it or is it just entertainment i think it's gonna be with you anything that you take in is what you make of it right so it's it's all dependent upon what you decide to do with the information that you receive. And I think that it was done in the documentary was done in such a way that, um, if you watched it and you didn't consider the different points of views or the contrast of the different points of views or the contrast of the dialogue, Mm -hmm. then you wasted your time because it, it was not in, it was entertaining. Right. Only to a point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it was entertaining. Like, when I first saw, I was like, oh, yeah, I got to watch this. You know what I'm saying? Right. But to watch it, you really did. You had to take in information. You had to take in the different mindsets of the people that she was talking to. Yes. And you even had to take in her mindset of where it was she was really trying to go. Because she didn't impose her thoughts upon anyone. Right. There was a, a a point where she sat down, I believe, in Orange County with a group of white ladies. And the conversation was quite different from the uh conversation she had with the group of black college students, which of course it would be. Right. But the point is where there was for the most part the at least one white woman for sure just didn't get it. Right. She was like, Well, I I did this and I did that and I made something of myself. I don't understand how come they can't just do it too. Right. There's that. That's that privilege. And then the other one is they should just get over it. Right. That now that's the way the lady I was talking about. Oh, the yeah. lady that I was talking yeah, about. Why, that ended like, over four hundred years ago. Yeah, why can't like, they just why can't get they just it? let it go? Why can't they get over it? Well, same reason why you can't get over that we should take down these statues of people that enslaved us you know right i mean or in the in the same the same regard that that they talk about the holocaust victims 
the Holocaust survivors yeah. and what it did to Jewish people and what it did for race relations of that time. So in the same regard that they won't let that go, why should we right. let our Holocaust exactly. go? Exactly. Why should we like, why should we just forget about that? And especially when we still have systems that are set up to keep us in those say same enslaved positions in society. Right. And one of the, one of the biggest differences between their Holocaust and our Holocaust is that while they did go through years of suffering, the level of suffering that they went to went through doesn't compare to the savagery that we endured. Now their concentration camps were rough, but they mainly starved them and then they burned them or they put them in a gas chamber. We were raped in front of our children. We were raped in front of our, our husbands. We were told that we weren't worthy of having these subsystems of a family. We weren't allowed to learn how to read, you know, that was forbidden. That was a crime. And we weren't allowed to, to even, you know, take baths and, and it lasted for years as opposed to, and I'm not saying that their Holocaust is like, it's not comparing, you know, your pain to my pain, but in terms of what we endured, I'd almost rather you just put me in the gas chamber and it'd be over than to keep going through it and going through it. And now if you look at what has happened in our world as a result, you know, they say the Jewish people own everything or there's like jokes about the Jewish mafia and this, that, and the other. They were able to somehow come out of it and end up a lot of times in good places and end up on top. And we still over here going, yeah, well, is yeah, there a top? When, yeah, because they, when we tried, they bombed us. Exactly. You know, and multiple times. We we tried multiple times. And, exactly. And so each time if we you got won't bombed, forget, and, yeah. then why should we? Right. Well, and then you've done so much. Right. <laughs> so, like, why should we? Like, you need to be reminded. You, like, I agree. I mean, quite honestly, when it comes down to, um, I guess, Holocaust or how, you know, whatever you, whatever you want to say. We're second only to Indians because they pretty much, they wiped out the Indians. Yes. You know what I mean? They just pretty with much. The, and with a smile. Yeah. Here's a blanket full of diseases. There Keep you yourself go. warm. You know, and they just, <laughs> yeah, they just pretty much tried to just totally wipe them out. We're only here because we were their economic structure. You right. know what I mean? We we contributed to their economic structure. Right. We were we their were, entertainment. We were their finance. We you were know, their everything. concubines. We were their all, all of we, that. I mean, we were everything. And you know, when I think of we like created so much, so many yeah. things that we don't even realize that we created because the only thing that well, they say I'm not going to say, but you know, <laughs> they say the only original thing that white people created was the patent. <laughs> so you know, if you if you were an indentured servant to a white man and you came up with a great idea it was not your idea no not it at all was his, we didn't so. even own our thoughts right I mean, exactly you so, know so much was taken how could i mean how could you say that you know we should forget or we should just get over it but we didn't even own our thoughts i mean think about that well i mean it's easy to say when it's not your history when it's not your reality when it's not part of your being i mean you know what i mean like right. he, that i mean she said that uh, but she comes from a state of white privilege right where so there that is like <laughs> you know like tiffany said to chelsea you know you know your story right you, you've never been on the bottom you've never had a time in history where you've been on the bottom and you had to claw your way back from being on the bottom or under the bottom for you know or for even us having to fight to get to where you are like honestly you right you didn't you, have to have special yeah. laws created just to, so you right, could so you know could that there was a table the door yeah right so you know not even have a seat at the table but we had to create laws just so we could see there's a table over there yeah and then eventually we like oh can we can i get a chair is there a chair is there a stool is there a stool is there what what i thought was really was really interesting about her um about her her documentary was that she dated a guy and i and i forgive me i forget it i think it was tyshawn or or uh, yeah was it tyshawn yeah but but she dated a black a black man and became pregnant by him yes, more than and once was, and was pregnant by him um at one point and she was a teenager and he was a teenager 
And um, she used to, you know, she talked about how she did drug runs with him and how she was there with him when he got stopped by police and how the police would let her go, mm-hmm. but they would keep him. And how for so long she was just totally ignorant as to why that was going on. And she right. didn't realize until she got older that it was really white privilege, that it was the color of her skin that got her out of those situations. But that man ended up doing 15 years in jail. Now mm-hmm. that was not her fault. You know what right. I'm saying? Basically, yeah, it was choices that was made at the time. But she also understood that the choices that he made were not done out of selfishness they were done because he didn't feel as though he had another choice right and so many times we you know it's you know it's always said i gotta do what i gotta do my family gotta eat my mama gotta eat i gotta do what i gotta do and unfortunately the options for us even now are very slim so we gotta do what we gotta do they're limited i mean especially when you are in the projects and every day you're you know you see the same people everybody's doing the same thing Mm -hmm. you're living with crackheads you're related to crackheads you know you i'm you know what i mean like i mean i know that's not a whole lot of us children learn what they live now yeah yeah, you learn what you live right and when the people that you are looking up to are the are the dudes on the corner the guys out there in the street Mm -hmm. it doesn't leave you feeling as though you have a whole lot of options you know what i mean and it and especially when you need money now because and it looks glamorous i mean to a to a certain extent it looks glamorous it looks fun it looks like you are living the life but what these these people who are in that life often don't tell the young people that are looking up to them is the reality I can't sleep at night. You know, I'm not even sure. I'm always looking over my shoulder when I'm driving because I don't know if the cops going to get me or if that man that I wronged is going to come get me. They don't. Yeah. They're and not you know, I'm not even sure that. if that's the, I don't even, I mean, I don't even, I don't know because things are so different now as to where, when we grew up, right. I don't know if that, I don't, I don't believe it's the same at all. Like, you know, I don't, I don't think dope boys are making money. You know, <laughs> you know, what and I mean, I mean not for real, you know, they, uh, they may not be, they're not, you know, making like riches, but they make it enough where they're living what at looks least comfortable. To, right. And able to provide some sort of comfort for, a, mm. for the family. Or yeah, whatever. But if, that's kind of getting off, that's kind of getting off topic in, 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 because I don't really know, I don't know nothing about the dope world to really even talk about it. I know, <laughs> I know enough because, because the kids that I service live ah, it. Ah, see. So yeah, I, you got I, a different aspect. I, yeah, so I get a, a glimpse in, into it. And for me, you know, with my square job and my square degrees, trying to tell these kids that this life you see isn't really what you see. Yeah, he got a nice car. Yeah, it looks like he's got three or four chicks, but he also don't sleep well at night. Mm-hmm. He also got to make his home out in the suburbs because the same hood that he sells in, he can't live in. Man, let me tell you. And then once you get a couple of felonies racked up on you, you have totally locked yourself out of the rest like of the functional world. functional society. Right, so yeah. it makes it more prevalent that white privilege kicks in because you've locked yourself out of having any type of privilege in any capacity mm, i see what so you're it makes on that, that sore yeah so while white privilege is truly a thing one thing that i think black people don't do well is that we don't look at ourselves and go how am i solving it fixing it or how am i keeping it going and then we get to a point where we get so far pushed back we don't even attempt to push forward anymore we like this is where i'm at this is what it is and i'm cool comfort you get yeah you get comfort comfortable zone. and you just start living down here but i think I, I i i mean i think as far as that goes that's all about your that's all about how you really want to live i mean because at some point you gotta realize this can't be life at some point you gotta realize this can't be every day i can't keep doing it like this i right. gotta do something legitimate 
I got to. I got to have. There's got to be a retirement plan. I got to <laughs> be able to put something in my name. I got to be able to go buy a house and not have anybody look at me like, where'd this money come from? Because you've never had a job. And I can't put it in somebody else's name for fear of if we break up that they're going to take it out. You know, at some point, you, you right. really got to think about that. And I think, um, you know... I think, it, I think, I don't know. I don't know because like, I, I don't have any insight to that world, but I'm just saying that at some point you got to realize that that can't be your life forever. But, um, but what other options do I have? If I, if I live in this, this world full of white privilege that I don't know how to navigate and well, now, see, now there it is. That's the issue right there. Learn to navigate it because you have to. There has to come a point. If you can learn to navigate the street, then you need to learn how to navigate life. I agree. Because streets is not your life unless that's what you make it. If you decide right. to stay there, then that's where you'll always be. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. if you decide at some point, like, okay, I'm going to take this time while either while I'm incarcerated or why I'm in this little situation I'm in or whatever right. to go get education, educated on a trade or go get a degree so that right. I can step up and maneuver and navigate in this world of right. white privilege and oppressive systems. And so, you know what I mean? Right. Um, but I don't think a lot of, you know, I think she, I think the way that she went about, about doing the documentary and just taking on the task of the topic itself was really commendable because she she took and ex- she she examined her own life she got right. opinions from mm-hmm. other people she went into venues and spaces that most white people would not feel comfortable going into right you know and um she made an attempt you know what i'm saying to try and really connect and really be informed and that was the right. thing she didn't just come in asking questions she came in really seeking knowledge really trying to understand where she is and how she might be able to make a change or make something better or make an effort. Right. And she did plenty of interviews. She did, she did quite she a did few interviews. She did, you know, she interviewed, um, I can't think of his name. He, the CNN show, um, Tim Wise. No, not, she yes, Tim him. Wise. She interviewed him. She interviewed, uh, this comedian named Kamal. That's who it is. That's who I'm thinking of. Who it, is That's what I'm thinking of. Married to a white woman. Right. And so, he does that show on CNN. Oh, what is it called? Something America. I want to Colors say. of America or, or something, something like, like that. It's something like that. Or like, yeah, because he originally wanted to call it Black in America and CNN was like, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah, too much. Too much. Yeah. You're taking him too fast. So yeah, but he is married to a white woman. So he talked about, you know, going places with his wife and doing things and navigating this world on both sides of it because mm-hmm. he is afforded a certain amount of white privilege because, because he has he's money. Married. Well, because he has, he has money, money and, and he's married to a white, white woman. Right. Yeah. Which is, which is crazy. So as a black man who gets the privilege to toggle those worlds. And that's only if you messing with the right people, because then you got some white people that's like, Ugh, like, right. You know, that's tainted whatever tainted you goods. know what i mean you know they they, right. they just they just don't approve or whatever you know yeah because so and it's, it just depends on who you dealing with in that in that i think so because you know the world like like serena's married to a white man which is she I, married i didn't know yeah. she got married yeah she married she he's, married her baby daddy and he's a billionaire so yeah he, i ain't mad at him. he got he got dough but and people were like mad and up in arms and i'm like you know why really like what first of all why are you mad you didn't have a chance with her let's Ah. let's start let's start there because of what she said it's because of what she said but how you can't deny her her truth right that's her truth right you You, know you can't tell me not to live my life or not to not to like you said live in my truth this is who i am at the end of the day i'm still a black woman who still gets shut out of a lot of things just because i'm black or treated right or treated differently because because i'm black right and then I chose to marry a white man and I'm shunned even more By for my that. Own community. Yeah, right. so now she's catching it from both sides. So And that in that is that is so that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> because that's something I would get into, but that is a whole nother topic because so many men were so pissed off. Yeah. By like, that. But but I have a diff I, I have a take on that 
that would that's another segment. Okay. So I probably I'm not gonna say because so, that's a whole yeah. Another, so we have to table for that. Yeah, that's a whole another segment because right it, there. And it is just a you know not to go off into the to the rabbit hole of that, but it is a thing about when white men choose black women versus when black men choose white women. It's a whole thing, and it's a it's a whole weird dynamic thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so we'll have to talk because, about that yeah, thing, because, right? Because it's like it's it's like it's a it's like it's a double edged sword. Yeah, kind and of there is situation. a huge double standard. There, yes, yeah, like yes, but it's like you, but you, you, you did it though. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like there right. was a point where you told us that we wasn't. See, I'm about to get into it. No, don't stop. get into it. All right, I'm gonna try not to. I'm gonna try not. All right, so you got our self care assignment. Do I? What did I do? No, I didn't. Okay, I told you that was the thing I forgot to look up. Was this, I was so okay. busy looking for the other that I forgot to look for that. So then we'll say for for this episode, your your self care is to live in your truth, live in your biases, correct those biases that you live with and that you live in because we all have them. We have implicit biases. We have in biases that are inflicted upon us Gender. by. By what we see. Yeah. So you have these biases. So I'm going to say for, for this episode of self-care is figure out those biases, know them, and then figure out how to deal with people without letting your biases show. Just figure that out. Because it it's it's rough when it comes to white privilege, black privilege, because we got some of Here those too. Okay. Be open-minded. I'll take that. Like, forget take the that, stereotypes. Be open minded. You know what I mean? Because you don't know anybody's struggle. You, no, don't know you, don't. The, you don't know the next person's mm-hmm. struggle. You don't know the who's, the what's, the why's, the where's. You don't know. And, and everybody's story is different. Mm hmm. So, of course, there's brain science for everything. Well, brain science me, sis. I'm a brain, brain science me. So, we're going to talk about understanding the racist brain. I bet you didn't uh-huh. know that there was such a thing. Of course, I did. Right. I'm a black woman. Okay. <laughs> There's a sexist brain, a racist brain. Yes, there is. Yes. Okay, go ahead. All right, so calling someone a racist is a serious accusation with powerful psychological effects. Such a label should only be used when there is compelling evidence to support it, as there's no better way to lose a potential ideology ally than by calling them a racist when they really are not one. So with that being said, it is just as harmful to society to pretend that racism doesn't exist and that it isn't a massive problem. So there are neurological pathways that will explain the underlying racism. So this one's really long, so I'm just going to shorten it for the second time. So brain imaging studies have shown that people who display implicit bias have a stronger electrical response to black or other races faced in an area of the brain called the amygdala, which is down here. It is the structure responsible for processing emotional stimuli and eliciting fearful or anxious mental state. An exaggerated amygdala response is part of what creates that sudden visceral or gut feeling of being scared. That's your fight, flight, or fright right. response. Mm. So, in people with healthy, healthy functioning brains, the fast amygdala response activates the region of the brain known as the prefrontal com- prefrontal cortex which is up here which is slower and plays a regulatory role when the fear system is triggered i got a big one of those because i'll be sitting around like look hey so (laughs) your your prefrontal areas work to assess the situation rationally and calm those pesky automatic systems that make you fearful i.e when you see black people you cross the street you lock your doors you grab your purse you shoot them or you shoot them. Yes. Mm. So thanks to these studies and specific regions of the brain, the anterior cingulate cortex, the brain exercises cognitive control, suppressing inappropriate or prejudiced judgments and behavior. So the problem with that is not everyone has a healthy functioning prefrontal cortex. Ain't that the truth? And Rude. these are the people who <laughs> let their biases control them. Mm. They cannot reason those fearful surges away because they lack the cognitive mechanisms that normally allow people to do so. So interestingly enough, these imaging studies have found links between impaired frontal lobes, functioning, and religious fundamentalism. Now, see, now, now, here, now, to hear that put that way, 
<laughs> because I've always thought of racism as a learned thing. Because as children, you don't know what it is until your parents teach it to you. Right. Or until someone teaches it to you. But so think about... what does that mean? Does that mean that... that I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, what does that mean? Because that that would imply scientifically that you're either born racist or you're not. Yes and no. It shows that, as you said, children are not born with it. It has to be cultivated. So when you think about brain science and brain development and rearing children, Ah. we are rearing the children based on what we know, based on what we've been taught, based on what we've been shown. Mm -hmm. So when our children's brains are forming, we're teaching them what we know. So in fact, we are teaching them. We are shaping how their prefrontal cortex. So basically all of the Ku Klux Klan had their frontal cortex shortened. Exactly. By lack of good teaching. Exactly. Right. So all that superior white folk nation individuals, (laughs) no matter what degree they got, they got little itty bitty front of cortexes. Yes. So here's how you fix it in a nutshell. One prominent and fascinating feature of your brain is its plasticity or the ability to be rewired in response to new incoming information from our environment and our new experiences. Through exposure to new stimuli, new symptom connections can be formed, creating neural pathways that can promote a restructuring of old and rigid belief systems. Additionally, cognitive exercises like focused breathing and meditation can train your prefrontal cortex to attenuate a hyperactive amygdala and control those bad instincts. So basically, you can kick your frontal lobe into gear and just... Just get get it pumping and get it growing if you receive proper information, the nutrients of the man. <laughs> <laughs> so look. To, to get it growing and, and nutrition and water it. So with those efforts that you just mentioned. Yeah. Those efforts might not do much to change the worldview of a staunch race, racist. That could require more extreme therapeutic measures such as pharmacological treatment. Shock therapy. To reset the brain. Uh, cycloglim, which is the ingredient in magic mushrooms or LSD, mm. along what with about talk the therapy stuff in Disney yes. movies, could be an effective <laughs> way to alter your worldviews and dissolve should, your biases. Hey, look, we need to make a great big old motion picture movie <laughs> thing of the boondocks and put a whole bunch of subliminal little stuff in there for the grow white folks from the course. <laughs> I'm sleepy. Yeah, don't so, pay me no attention. <laughs> unfortunately, this will require the races to be open-minded enough to give such an experimental treatment a try, which is unlikely but not impossible. When we mm. should remember that, in fact, which is that which is worth reiterating, it is not impossible. So well, it is not impossible to change the mind of a racist. It's not. That's a good thing. Maybe one day we can. We can all change. We can kumbaya with the white sheets. Maybe. Possibly. Hopefully one day we can get all that racism crap up out of here. And the best Before way to... Before Mother Nature and God decide that they are going to tsunami us say, all because and if... take us out with mosquitoes from the Amazon Look that's here. carrying brain Ma'am. eating diseases. Yeah, I'm, that cool. guy, I'm so scared to go outside. I ain't even playing. I'm I'll be outside and back like, oh, I feel them. They bouncing off me. I'm <laughs> going in. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I mean, you can't avoid a mosquito bite for real, for real. If you go outside, it's no. out there. But good Jesus, this, my brain is going to deteriorate. <laughs> I'm already gonna have dementia. I don't need no. to get bit to make it happen even faster. But you're not gonna have dementia. You know I why? Hope not. Because you, like many of our viewers and listeners take the time to first love yourself which is the fly with us acronym so as you practice the self-care and you recognize your implicit biases and you're working to fix them and you're working to change the world through us because that's what we're doing and every time we go out and we touch somebody else for every episode that they see we are changing the world one episode at a time look at you with that ribbon in that bow you know what I'm saying you gotta, you gotta tie it all up and, and make it, it work. You put it in a box this time, girl. In a, in a pretty box. It was pretty. Pretty with glitter. 
So you can find us in our box on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, SoundCloud, YouTube, and you can email us at flywithusla at gmail.com. I'm Lady Bounce. I'm Kryptonite. And we out. All right. <laughs>